right, let me start with a couple questions. What are my current coordinates? Shout them out as you know them. Come on, don't be shy. No, it's all right. We'll go on to the next one. What's an umbrella? What do you use it for? Is it going to rain here today? This is crazy. It's been like 15 seconds. You haven't even answered the first question. Siri, is it going to rain today? Should I carry an umbrella? It doesn't look like it's going to rain today. So what does Siri do to answer those questions faster than any of you did? Well, it started with speech recognition. She figured out that I was talking about this thing called an umbrella, so she could find it. She knows that it has to do with rain. So she pulled my current location and the forecast and figured out if it was going to rain and gave me a final result. All of that in less than five seconds. So what exactly is Siri? Well, if you're not familiar, Siri is an artificial intelligence program, or as Apple likes to call her, a virtual assistant. We all use differing amounts of AI every single day in our lives, from getting on social media to getting directions home at the end of the day, but we hardly ever stop to think about exactly how it works and what it's already capable of. As somebody who uses AI every single day to get through my day, I'm so excited to be able to share with you the process of how we teach AI and what other incredible things it's already capable of. Tonight, we're going to uncover how deep machine learning, which is the most common form of machine learning in AI today, is similar to our own minds by analyzing neural structural networks and how they work in the real world. So as I said, deep machine learning is the most common form of machine learning in artificial intelligence today, and I'd like to start by taking a deeper look at it. What exactly is deep machine learning and what are we doing? It's simple at first. We're teaching computers how to learn and we're trying to simulate learning inside of a computer. Christopher Mezzarali, in an article that he wrote, talks about two key factors, probability and statistical data. Computers use it and so do we. For computers, it makes sense. They're based on numbers. Of course, every, every function that they perform is gonna be relying on some probability and some statistical data. But for us, it might not be so obvious at first. But when you get in the car at the end of a long day, even if you're not using your GPS to get home, in your brain, you're thinking of all the different possible ways that you could get home, what the traffic on the major roads is like, which one's the most direct, and ultimately, you're deciding on what's going to probably get you home the quickest way. AI uses these things called synthetic neural networks. They're structures that mimic the neurons in our own head, and Mezzarelli offers this quote to help us understand that. God created humans in his image. We created artificial intelligence in our image. Now this quote speaks to how the neurons inside of computer chips are so similar and they're identical to the ones inside of our own minds, right? They chunk information down into little sub-layers and each neuron's completing a smaller part of the puzzle so that a bigger task can ultimately be achieved. One example of this would be if detecting there, if there's a face in an image or not. A computer, is looking, each neuron is looking for specific patterns of circles and lines, just like we do without even thinking about it. Finally, it's looking for the telltale sign of a face, which is two eyes and a nose, just like we do without even thinking about it. Now what's absolutely crazy is computers and AI learn how to do this all by themselves. The programmer only needs to put in a few initial parameters, like how many total neurons to use, and the computer figures out what the optimal and most efficient way to work is. Now that we've seen how AI learns, let's take a look at how it works in the real world because there are so many more uses for it than getting the weather and getting directions home at the end of the day. The first big use is for people like myself with disabilities. There's a technology called optical character recognition. This takes scan text and makes it accessible and interactable to blind users like myself who use screen readers to access computers. Now what's absolutely crazy is it gets these documents up to 98% correct, which is astonishing because it's doing entire documents faster than you can read one paragraph with your eyes, according to a, an article called Optical Character Recognition. Next is actually in social media. There are scene and facial recognition algorithms running on Instagram and Facebook that give oral feedback to blind users like myself about what you're posting in your pictures. It'll tell me who's in the photo, what's in the photo, and where the photo's taken, and you don't have to do anything. It's all because of machine learning and artificial intelligence. Now, as great as AI is for those of us with disabilities, it helps all of us be more productive in our everyday lives, and I'd like to show you a quick example of how. This is the Roomba, right? The robot vacuum. Everyone knows and loves it. This particular model, though, is the Roomba 980. 
What this one has that other models don't is cameras and sensors all over it. And Will Knight from MIT talks about how this vacuum is able to map out the room so that it can avoid objects in its way and you get a more efficient clean because it's not going over the same spot a million times and it's not missing spots altogether. Now over spring break, I had a really unique opportunity to see this technology at work on a much larger scale. I was able to take a test drive, well, I'm blind, I can't drive so that wouldn't have been safe. <laughs> a test ride in a Tesla Model 3. Um, during the ride, we got on the highway and we were doing 80 miles an hour. And as soon as autopilot switched on, there was no human interaction. And the car was able to keep up with the, with the flow of traffic. And all you had to do was press the turn signal and the car would change lanes, pass vehicles, and at the end of the ride, it even put itself in a parking spot without any human interaction. Now the last area we're gonna talk about AI being extremely helpful is in the medical world. According to an article titled, Cancer Cells Distinguished by Artificial Intelligence-Based System, there was this team at Osaka University that discovered and created this AI program that could run, and it was initially starting to help doctors make cancer diagnoses because some forms of cancer look so similar and it can be very difficult to distinguish. But now, that program is even more accurate than human doctors making the diagnosis. Isn't that astonishing? And on top of that, it can even tell if these specific cancers will be receptive or not to radiation therapy so that we don't have to dump countless time, effort, and money into the treatment if it's not gonna be an option for that patient. To wrap up for today, we talked about deep machine learning, which is the most common form of machine learning found in artificial intelligence today. We talked about synthetic neural networks and how they're so, much, they're so similar to the neurons inside of our own minds and how they all work together on smaller tasks to accomplish the bigger overall task. Having artificial on your team, having artificial intelligence on your team is like having somebody with a super brain because it's modeled just like our brain, only exponentially faster. When we learn to see AI as a member of the team and not just a program running on the computer, we will work so much more efficiently and be able to improve the state of humanity and the world. Thank you.